from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, a regulation for one dog breeder should be a regulation for all dog breeders. That was the sentiment from a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. We'll explain in this half hour. We'll meet a corrections officer at the Southern Regional Jail to hear about the issues affecting the men and women on the front lines of West Virginia's correctional system. And for the first time in about 70 years, a Republican is the Speaker of the House, for a few minutes anyway at the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. The House Finance Committee today considered an amendment for House Bill 4260, which determines insurance coverage for autism spectrum disorders. As Adam Cavalier reports, the bill has weighed heavily on many of the delegates involved. Kanawha County Democrat Mark Hunt has a child with autism. He's a co-sponsor on the bill. Hunt says he just wants to see the bill through. This bill is not so much for my child. My, this bill is for other people's children. And knowing that early intervention does make an extreme difference, I feel like that we're fiddling while children are actually burning out there. And every year we delay the implement, implementation of this bill or the full implementation of this bill a whole generation of children are being lost. The bill provides $30,000 a year for behavioral therapy for three years before dropping down to $2,000 a month. Finance Committee Counsel Janelle Jones says the bill clarifies exactly what that $30,000 should cover. The problem was when it left the house, the $30,000 cap applied to ABA therapy and then the Senate amended in language that said the $30,000 cap applied to all treatment for autism, which could include a drug regimen or other types of treatment that would be different from ABA therapy. The fiscal note was produced by PEIA in ranges from 12 to $22 million. Jones says the note doesn't differ from last year's version of the bill. However, she does say that this year's version creates consistency in the code. It makes the $2,000 cap Um, applicable to only ABA as opposed to all treatment. The Green Bill did that for the $30,000 cap, but then that left the code inconsistent between a $30,000 cap and a $2,000 month cap. So the white, the committee substitute makes it consistent that any cap applies to only ABA therapy as opposed to all treatment. Finance Committee Vice Chair Tom Campbell says the bill's topic makes it rather taxing. It's such a complex disorder that can lead to so many different complications, particularly obviously among children. Um, So we want to deal with it and help our insurance providers and everybody deal with it, but we've got the struggle with the financial responsibility because while we'd love to solve every problem out there for everything, we have limited resources. The bill states that a child must be diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder by age eight for the coverage to take effect. Wayne County Democrat Doug Reynolds says that's too young and tried to change it with an amendment. I can't think of anywhere else in the code where we take some benefit and restrict it based on the diagnosis of a child. I mean, there's going to be, I don't think it'll be a very large physical cap, physical no. Most people are going to know their child has autism before age eight. But in, you know, cases where it's mild or things of that nature, it makes no sense to me why we would have a bar at age eight. And even if there is somewhat of a physical note, um, if the difference is $2,000 to $3,000, those are probably the kids that need the help the most. My fear is, though, in doing that, that we endanger the coverage for those that we're already covering because of the large price tag. Um, I know the committee last year worked diligently with other states and with state agencies to try to cover as many children we could in a responsible manner, and I think this bill does that. All we're trying to do today is correct a, an error that sometimes occurs late in sessions when bills don't pass exactly the way they think we had them pass. So we're, that's all we're trying to do with this bill. And I'm afraid if we adopt the gentleman's amendment, we're going to go beyond that. And, uh, and actually, if we lose this bill, we, we will restrict coverage. Ultimately, Reynolds' amendment failed by voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. The bill's lead sponsor, Barbara Fleshauer, says what matters most are those affected by the disorders. It's financially important, but it's also important you know, for all those children that, that, that are going to have their development 
um, stunted or slowed and will be inside themselves. I mean, we want these kids to be fully participating adults. And that's what can happen if you get this early intensive education. While Reynolds' amendment failed, the Finance Committee passed the bill unanimously. It now goes to the House floor. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. With a public hearing on Governor Earl Ray Tomlin's drug abuse bill was held this afternoon, Wyoming County Democrat Linda Phillips took to the House floor this morning to tell a compelling story about how this issue affects young children. Phillips told the story of a young girl whose mother did drugs while she was pregnant with her. She was born with the addiction of her mother. In the hospital, she was given phenobarbital. Then she was removed from that. She cried. She shook. She screamed. She cried for seven months. Cold turkey. She tried to kick that habit that she inherited from her mother in the womb. Since her grandparents already had custody of her two older brothers, they received Adriana as well. On weekends, she was allowed to go visit with her mother. She would come home quiet and calm. They couldn't understand why. Because she was allowed to lick the fingers of whoever had done drugs in that household, they wanted her quiet. And if they let her lick their fingers or if they kissed her on her lips, then the drug was in Andriana's body. Philip cited a study conducted over one month that indicated 19% of the children born in eight of the state's hospitals had been exposed to either alcohol or drugs during the pregnancy. The legislature tried to get a handle on puppy mills, irresponsible dog breeders who put profit over animal welfare. Senate Bill 406 seeks to protect dogs by creating regulations for commercial dog breeding operations. The bill was before the Senate Judiciary Committee today. A committee substitute was introduced that exempts hunting, tracking, show dog, and greyhound breeders from state regulation. This infuriated Senator Karen Facemeyer. She attempted to take those exemptions out of the bill. We've got a lot of responsible breeders out there. Just because there's several puppy mills out here need to be dealt with, and I think they can be dealt with through our laws already on the books. Maybe they, they have to be strengthened. I've tried to look at them and see how to do it. And we're more worried about last year when I talked to this group, and they have valid points. I don't disregard their points whatsoever, but they're tired of seeing, you know, all these puppy mills and stuff setting up in the Walmart parking lot and Sam's parking lot, selling them, especially at Easter time and through the summer and stuff, and some of the undue conditions they're in. But that's a few people, and I do believe there's laws already on the books to handle that. And if not... If that's the case, then all we have to do is have Walmart and them to put up the no solicitation signs or the county commission put in no solicitations there, and that can be handled. But if we're going to piecemeal this together, not all the groups were here. The groups may be screaming the loudest and have the loudest voice politically were here, but we still have a lot of breeders out here. And from the fact that other animals and stuff are in the state are not regulated, that are sold commercially, ought to be a good view of what's coming in the future from the Humane Society and how they tend to take over everything uh, within the state. So I would strongly urge that we pass this amendment. We're either serious about regulating dogs in the breeding business or we're not. Thank you. All those in favor of the amendment offered by Senator Facemeyer, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it, the no's do have it, the amendment is rejected. Are there any further amendments regarding... And that bill will be on first reading in the Senate tomorrow. The Senate passed just one bill today. Senate Bill 214 is a technical bill to clarify that a sunrise review is required for the establishment, revision, or expansion of a professional scope of practice.
from continuing education. Today's floor sessions brought speeches about what the state has or has not done about the education system. Senator Clark Barnes introduced today Senate Bill 610. It's a major rewrite of the state's education code and includes the creation of charter schools. In West Virginia, we have a crisis. We have a crisis in several areas, but until we until we take care of the crisis in education, then we can't address the crisis of poverty. Many of the things in West Virginia which we're dealing with. In West Virginia, we spend $3.5 billion a year in state and federal money on education. We are eighth in educational spending relative to our income. Yet West Virginia students rank below the national average in 21 of 24 categories measured by the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Our West Virginia's K-12 education system came in dead last on the American Legislative Exchange Council's annual report card released in January of this year. The Education Reform Act of 2012, which was introduced today as Senate Bill 610 will implement many desperately needed reforms to get the state's education system working. But Education Chairman Senator Robert Plymel took issue with his Republican colleague. He reminded the Senate that Governor Tomlin released an audit of the State Department of Education at the beginning of the session. He noted that the Senate has passed Senate Bill 436 to facilitate and encourage collaboration between the public school system and public higher education. And I will tell you that I think this is one of the areas that we are going to look at. And I think this is one that, that I'm not sure in this uh, body in terms of this session, we have enough time to look at that from a comprehensive nature re resulting from the audit. So I would like to tell you that I think this body has taken a lot of action that has been positive. We had have some now, but in defense of the governor, the audit was paid for. It, it is comprehensive in nature, and it is so comprehensive that you can't just pick out one element of personnel that you need to ch change right now, it has to be a comprehensive approach. Coming up, we'll meet one of the men working on the front lines of West Virginia's correctional system. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today and what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 608, to authorize the use of a search warrant to draw blood when a person is believed to be driving under the influence of drugs. Senate Bill 609, to implement a complete streets policy that considers the needs of drivers, vehicles, bicyclists, and pedestrians of all ages and abilities in planning roads and sidewalks. Senate Bill 610, to improve schools and school districts. Senate Bill 611, to create a special community-based pilot program to help at-risk youth in a selected county in West Virginia. And Senate Bill 618, to require municipal courts and magistrate courts to wait at least 80 days from the date the person is charged with a motor vehicle violation before notifying the Division of Motor Vehicles of that person's failure to pay or failure to appear. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 410, to make West Virginia law consistent with federal law on withholding of personal income tax on gambling winnings. Senate Bill 421, creating the Captive Servid Farming Act to allow deer farms to sell venison. Senate Bill 477, to prohibit the possession of wild and exotic animals. Senate Bill 499, to expressly exempt the Public Employees Insurance Agency, or any plan established by PEIA, from the requirements of the State Insurance Code. And Senate Bill 527, to revise the antiquated stock laws of West Virginia. Among the bills on second reading, Senate Bill 73, regulating tanning facilities, and Senate Bill 518, prohibiting persons convicted of a felony from holding an elected or appointed office. Governor Tomlin signed Senate Bill 165 yesterday. It prohibits sexual contact between inmates and correctional officers. The penalty is a felony and carries jail time of one to five years and up to a $5,000 fine. The new law was requested by the Legislative Oversight Committee on Regional Jail and Correctional Facility Authority. 
Joining us tonight to discuss the issues relating to correction officers is Corporal Hal Withrow, a corrections officer at the Southern Regional Jail for the past seven years. And Elaine Harris, an international representative with the Communications Workers of America who advocates on behalf of corrections officers. Welcome. Glad you're here. Okay. I want to tread around this first question lightly because this is a family show. But was this such a problem among correctional officers and inmates that there had to be a law passed to make it a felony? Well, just let me say um, there's always that um, potential. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we say right up front that's, that's not something that uh, is acceptable. And uh, when the legislation was put together, we got the assurances that the pat downs, the things that are necessary for the officers and uh, personnel to do their jobs mm -hmm. was in there. So the bill says that strip searches and touching and just searching in, the, in a security kind of manner uh, is exempt. Yes. But was this such an issue that we had to pass a law? It's not a major issue. Okay. No, it's an issue in every facility. There is always accusations, but it's not a major issue at the facility that I work at. Okay. Of course, there's accusations, but okay. um, All right. m they're mainly accusations. All right. We hear an awful lot about jail overcrowding, prison overcrowding. Is your jail overcrowded? We are overcrowded. Um, the last number I heard was that we had in the regional jail system, the 10 jails in the state of West Virginia, we have about 1,800 sentenced inmates waiting to go to the mm -hmm. Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. What are you telling the legislators about this issue, you know? Well, the whole area of public safety, you know, whether um, it be, you know, the, those that are out enforcing, trying to enforce the laws or those behind the walls, um, it's, um, it's difficult and, and uh, you know, we are in some difficult times economically, mm -hmm. uh, but we tell legislators that, um, you know, this is something that really needs to be looked at. Um, the whole overcrowding problem brings with it problems. The stress is strained that uh, is placed on um, these officers. And so uh, we are asking, you know, the starting pay mm -hmm. uh, for a correctional officer is a little over 22000 and um, as you know, Beth, mm -hmm. we're competing, you know, with other states, uh, with the feds, and, and sometimes the mining industry that folks are even looking, you know. And uh, so we would like to see that uh, starting pay increased. With a low starting pay and overcrowded prisons, how do you recruit new corrections officers to come in and work in this profession? It's a little difficult. How, how were you recruited? Um, well, I was in public service to start with, so once I finished the, the job that I was working at, mm -hmm. um, this was just natural for me t to get into this line of work. Um, but we go to job fairs to recruit, we run ads and papers, mm -hmm. the local job service, we work closely with them mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. constantly bring new people in. But we had a uh, federal prison open in McDowell County. My facility lost 18 officers just to that facility. The benefits are better and the pay is much higher. I see. So we always we lose um, officers to uh, police departments. Yeah. Describe what you do. Uh, basically, I'm a floor officer mm -hmm. and I um, <clears throat> provide care, custody, control for the inmate population in Southern Regional Jail. A lot of days I work booking, which is intake and release. Mm -hmm. So I uh, read court orders. Uh, I do pat down searches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you're you're watching. You're watching them. You're guarding. I'm watching. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right. There is a bill uh, going through now about disarming or attempting to disarm a correctional officer. Uh, Tell me the specifics about that because it's just left, left my head what that exactly does. It would make a, a, a felony uh, okay. to, uh, attempt, uh, to attempt to disarm or to disarm uh, a correctional officer. And uh, when the bill uh, was being uh, drafted, we wanted to make sure, because we also have parole officers, and uh, sometimes it takes an incident happening uh, that, to draw attention. And in this case, uh, down uh, in Mercer County, there was an inmate tried to disarm a uh, correctional officer, and actually it was that parole, a probation parole officer that helped, you know, in that situation. So it makes it a felony, and mm -hmm. we, you know, this is very serious. 
And this wasn't in the books prior to this. Prior to this bill coming up, this was not in state code, that you could not disarm a correctional officer or even attempt to disarm. Uh, it certainly is in the state code for other law enforcement officers. Right. That's, yes. And that's what the issue was? Yes. yes. Is this often? Does this happen often? It's very rare. Okay. But it's the first instance I've heard of since I've been there, but it's serious enough that it needs attention. You're right. There should be a penalty. You talked about, we've talked about recruitment and the difficulty of recruiting, losing 18 officers to the federal prison in McDowell County. Yes. Yeah. One of the things we hear a lot is that it's tough to recruit corrections officers, particularly at the federal level, because they're not passing drug tests. Yes. Are you drug tested? We are drug tested. Okay. Um, that's not a huge issue for it's us, not. to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. What happens if you don't pass a drug test or if somebody if, doesn't pass a drug test? If you don't pass a drug test, you don't get hired. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as testing while we're there, while we're working, there's, it's, would be on a, something would have to happen. It's a bad test. budget. It's a bad budget year. And we know that there are no pay raises for state employees. But you as an advocate, and you're talking to the legislators, and we've already heard there's not going to be a new jail, there's not going to be a new prison. Uh, built because the only thing you'll have is a brand new overcrowded prison. Right. So as you go to the legislature, how sympathetic, I guess, is the legislature to the issues of our corrections officers? Well, I think first starting with the oversight committee, and we visit that every month uh, with the legislative interims, and we go, we talk to those members, and as we talk to leadership, we tell them that uh, these um, are huge issues mm -hmm. because it takes about $22,000. When you um, go through the academy, uh, the training and everything that, that's uh, put you know, with mm -hmm. that. So 22,000, that's an investment. And uh, to lose those individuals. So you take that and you multiply it as, um, as uh, Corporal Withrow said, uh, times um, that number that have left, mm -hmm. uh, that adds up. And so it's just a, a, a constant churn. And I'm sure the legislature understands, but there's nothing they can do, right? Elaine Harris of the Communication Workers of America and Corporal Hal Withrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today and what's coming up in the House tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 4554, to allow counties that have fully implemented early childhood education programs to accept additional students for enrollment subject to space available. House Bill 4556, to require the Division of Motor Vehicles to identify the types of documentation required to be submitted when a name or address change has been made by a licensee. House Bill 4558, to provide that when a driver's license is suspended for failure to pay a fine for a motor vehicle violation, the suspension will be expunged from the person's driving record within 60 days after the payment of the fine or license reinstatement fee. House Bill 4568, to require the Division of Corrections to provide rehabilitation treatment programs to inmates who are sentenced to a state correctional center but are imprisoned in any jail in this state and House Bill 4569 to establish a legally recognized status of civil unions in this state. Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, House Bill 4015, creating the Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs within the Governor's Office. House Bill 4299 at the request of the Governor to permit a County Board of Education to use bus operators regularly employed in a different county to operate their school buses. House Bill 4330, to provide that driver's licenses may contain information designating the licensee as a person who is honorably discharged veteran of any branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. Among the bills on second reading, House Bill 3174, to allow Class A retail licensees or freestanding liquor retail outlets the ability to conduct responsible liquor sampling events on days of the week other than Sunday. House Bill 4119, to provide a definition for an athletic director who is employed by a county board of education and is responsible for the planning, management, operation, and evaluation of an athletic program. And House Bill 4433, to provide high school diplomas to veterans of any armed conflict or war, regardless of whether they were attending high school before entering the military. And finally tonight, a Republican took over House Speaker duties, albeit momentarily, when Minority Whip Mitch Carmichael filled in for Speaker Rick Thompson today. Mr. 
The switch was met with some laughable moments by House Democrats. I think the House will agree with me that this is really scary. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, would it be the proper time to move that collective bargaining bill you and I have been discussing? Carmichael says the Speaker asked him to fill in on a whim. Speaker Thompson and I have been great friends for a long time. We sat beside each other on the floor prior to his ascension into the speaker seat. Just a really good guy. And so uh, in uh, terms of uh, being able to work together and just have fun with some of the processes here, it's, it was a lighthearted moment and I enjoyed it. And I'm thankful to the speaker for the opportunity to do that. <laughs> it's typically Speaker Pro Tem Ron Fergale to fill in when Thompson must be elsewhere. Carmichael estimated that it was the first time in 70 years that someone other than a Democrat had acted as speaker. And this has been the legislature today. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night.